Welcome to part two of Steve Owen Talks About the Beach Boys. Uh, I had written down some notes, uh, not the musical notes, but notes uh, when you're like writing type notes when you're writing a book or something like that about what I would say next time and I was uh, reviewing it and I don't have the notes with me but I do recall a little bit about uh, some of the things that I wanted to say so uh, let's let's get into it um, I do recall going over to Brian Wilson's mansion in Beverly Hills uh, variously at times with a couple of buddies sometimes by myself uh, but we would always go to the gate. It was like a walk-in gate that had corridors behind it. And at that gate was a TV camera positioned right on the gate so they could look down upon the people that were um, standing at the gate and whoever was inside uh, could tell who was it there and would either yay them or nay them, let them in or not let them in. And then there was a little sign that said, stand back, speak clearly. So apparently this was uh, coordinated with audio so that if you pressed a button, the, the bell, uh, it was like a two-way talk thing. And usually it was manned by Brian's wife, Marilyn, and uh, understandably she didn't really uh, like a lot of strangers coming into her home. And I think a lot of stuff had come down uh, at that time, or it was about to come down. Anyway, there were people floating in and out at times and uh, I think it, it bothered her. So she would see somebody like myself and my friend whom she didn't really know, and we would ask for Brian, and she would say, Brian's not here right now, and uh, that would be the end of that. We'd have to go away and try our luck. And sometimes uh, Brian would be outside. He'd come and talk to us, let us in, and we'd talk to him other times. But many times it would be... Uh, going to the gate and uh, talking to Marilyn, who would say, well, sorry, but you can't come in. So, uh, <clears throat> Brian had built a studio in one of the areas of his home. It was like uh, this large area. It was like a whole wing. It must have been, I don't know, some sort of a dining area or something in the original uh, house that was built uh, for Edgar Rice Burroughs. And he had torn everything out and made that a studio. And up above, uh, way up above, looking down upon the studio was this small booth. You would climb the stairs and go up to the left and you'd be right there in the booth. And there was, of course, a, a window and he would look down and he could uh, direct the sessions. Often uh, there would be several Beach Boys hanging around and they would start with a pre-recorded track they already had going and uh, sometimes they would put that track on and add vocals. Mike would often be there singing his bass vocal. Uh, Carl or Al would be adding vocals and uh, often whoever was around the studio if they could sing at all, uh, which leads me to another story but I'll get to that in a moment, uh, they would utilize to sing backgrounds which I did a couple of times. So it was pretty groovy to be able to stand with uh, my heroes, uh, Carl Wilson, uh, Al Jardine, Mike Love, and sing harmonies into this mic on to the tape, which Brian was up in the booth directing. But getting back to that side story I want to tell you about, uh, a couple of times I was with Brian in his living room, and he wanted to know, he was in a four freshman mood, now, there's a couple of things you have to know about Brian. Brian uh, loves the four freshmen very dearly, and he also loves this song called Be My Baby. In one of his books, he talks about the fact that he heard it for the first time on the radio when he was driving, and he had to pull over because he was so overwhelmed, and he was telling, I think it was his wife, saying, this just blows my mind. This is the greatest thing I've ever heard. Well, uh... We would go into his living room and he had this uh, wonderful uh, record player, a dual turntable, which was one of the greatest. And he would put on this uh, record, Be My Baby, and he would play it over and over and over again. There was something he was listening for in this, or new things to explore that he hadn't heard before. 
and so it was almost as if he was hypnotized by listening to this track. But one day he pulled out this record uh, called Sing a Song with Riddle. And what it was, it was Nelson Riddle providing some backgrounds uh, that he recorded for people to sing along with in the mold of Sinatra or Dean Martin, etc. And he said, uh, you know, what is your voice like? Uh, here, I want you to sing this song. So he, he selected a track and then had me sing the, the lead over it live. And uh, I guess at that time he was analyzing my voice. And while I got the impression didn't, that he didn't think my voice was the greatest, I think he thought that it was okay to sing background and stuff. So that's how that came about. So that when I was in the studio, and he knew that I could uh, more or less sing some of these parts. Uh, one time I do recall we were recording uh, the Sunflower album, or they were recording. I was recording with them that day, just put my two cents worth in, and everybody was there. And he was having us do this one vocal part on this song called All I Want to Do. And all of a sudden he stopped and he says, everybody up. And I said, what? Everybody up? And it turns out that he wanted everybody that was singing that vocal to sing an octave higher. So all the parts that were uh, the chord that was lower all of a sudden now had to come up an octave. So it was a little high, and I was very worried that I wouldn't be able to do it, but uh, I was able to accomplish it and be sandwiched in between the rest of the boys. And uh, so that was very exciting. Um, thinking about uh, some of the boys and their personalities, uh, there is a uh, interview on YouTube uh, with Chuck Ritz talking about the Beach Boys, and he did mention uh, Dennis Wilson as being one of his favorites. And I also uh, found Dennis Wilson to be one of the greatest uh, human human beings uh, of the Beach Boys. He was really a loving person, and I can't say that enough. I mean, he came off as a tough guy and as uh, somebody that uh, was hard around the edges, but if you got to know him a little bit. He was quite wonderful and quite giving, and uh, his death was quite a tragedy. But uh, often I would uh, go over there, and Dennis would be there, and we'd take off somewhere, and we'd get in my 53 Chevy, which was kind of interesting, driving around Beverly Hills in this old beat-up 53 Chevy, kind of a cream-colored thing and uh, we'd be talking about things. He liked to talk about fishing. He loved fishing. And uh, it was one of the ways that he relaxed. Um, Al Jardine, I found very much uh, a very wonderful person. And he kind of took me under his wing a little bit and uh, explained things to me when I had questions about the Beach Boys because there was a history of the Beach Boys that I didn't know about before I had come on the scene, and I had a lot of questions, uh, mostly stupid stuff like what kind of car did Brian drive when he was uh, in 64 and blah, blah, blah. And Al was very patient, and he was able to answer a lot of my questions. Okay, I think this ends part of uh, part two. And I hope you enjoyed this, and we're going to go on uh, in the ensuing days, and we'll have some more parts.